So I have a, a little PowerPoint presentation. Normally when we do these talks in person, it'll be a walk and talk. And uh, hopefully that's gonna happen next year. Um, but usually what we do is I, I show a few photos and, and talk a little bit about the you know, wildlife and what we're looking at. And then we'll go out on the trail and see what we can see. So for this presentation, I'm uh, trying to <laughs> sort of recreate that experience with showing the slides that we usually show at the beginning and then showing some slides of of what we would be looking for when we actually do the nature walk so um the hardburger park most of the vegetation is a uh, ash juniper live oak woodlands which is a you know a very typical texas hill country vegetation type and it does support a quite a variety of wildlife species but in the park there has also been a very strong effort to restore the savanna ecosystem. And a savanna just means that it's grassland primarily interspersed with woody species like trees and shrubs. And um, a native prairie has a very high diversity of plant species, grasses and forbs, or as you know, most people call them wildflowers, like you can see in this, this photo of the uh, native prairie restoration at Hardburger Park. So it's great to have the woodlands and it's great to have the grassland and it's even better to have both types to help support a wider range of wildlife species. So a lot of studies have been done on the Hardburger Park. Uh, in 2007, studies were started for the master planning effort. So that's how long, how long ago <laughs> that these studies started happening. And a lot of those were to support the master planning of the park so that the people who were deciding how to design the park could have the most benefit for people as well as wildlife species. There have also been observations by park staff and volunteers and naturalists over the years. And in 2017 and 2018, there were trail camera studies. That means those types of cameras, you know, they're, they're called game cameras, trail cameras, where you have them sitting out um, facing places that wildlife might travel and they take pictures through a motion sensor technology meaning they take a picture when they detect a motion. So they got pictures of uh, people as well as wildlife. And uh, they, the cameras that were used were also um, set to do night photos using infrared light. So they had day photos and night photos. And through all these studies, we've found out that there are over 150 species of birds, at least 14 species of mammals, and half a dozen species of reptiles and amphibians that have been observed on the park. And um, a lot of people are especially interested in the mammals. So we focus a lot on those in this presentation. We have, well, this is the list of species of mammals that have been observed on the park. And I'm gonna show a few photos of a lot of these common species. Do we have any questions so far? Yes, we do. Uh, from Marjeska, with the game cameras, do you get any ringtails, uh, ringtail cats at night? We did get ringtails, and I'm going to show you a couple of those pictures. So just to show you kind of the proportion of different species that were caught by these game cameras or trail cameras. Um, this, <laughs> this little chart has a scale over here of number of captures, zero to 150. And most of the species, even humans, <laughs> that's how many, how many photos were captured of those individual species. So raccoons were a pretty big one, quite a few coyotes, quite a few cotton-tail rabbits. 
But this scale over here, we kind of had to have a split scale to show the huge number of white-tailed deer that we took photos. So essentially 10 times or 20 times as many white-tailed deer photos as any other species. White-tailed deer are very common species at Hardberger Park. So raccoons is one of the common species, as you just saw on that chart, one of the most common species that we had at, wild, at uh, Hardberger Park. And um, raccoons are a very intelligent and they're uh, known as omnivorous, which means they eat plants and animals and insects. They pretty much will eat anything. And if you've had problems with them getting into your trash cans or something like that, you know that they are very open to eating human food too. But actually in the wild, most of their diet, well, about half of their diet would consist of plants. They're also very fond of um, fish and clams and mussels. If you uh, get to go out at night and happen to see a raccoon in a pond, he'll probably be looking for fish, frogs, tadpoles, and, and clams that you can find in a pond or a stream. Um, and raccoons, like a lot of the wildlife species that we're gonna talk about are primarily nocturnal, which means they're active at night and sleep during the day. I've been fortunate to run into a raccoon. I was doing a bird survey during the day, but saw a raccoon all curled up sleeping in a tree. And um, one of the people on our bird survey, I actually got a photo of a bird that was picking the fur off the raccoon's back to use for his bird nest or her bird nest. So that was a pretty amazing observation. <laughs> Here's what a photo uh, from the, the trail camera taken at night of a raccoon looks like. And notice how he's got a you know, relatively short tail and a pretty stocky body. You can really see here how he's, he's got a very stocky body. Oh, and this culvert, this culvert here, you can see in this picture. Can you see my cursor when I do this? Good. Um, that's a culvert that goes under Wurzbach Parkway. We specifically set up the cameras on the culverts because a lot of wildlife species will use those to go back and forth under the highway, especially before there was a land bridge. That was pretty much the only way they had to get across that didn't you know, actually bring them into the traffic. So I'm glad someone asked about ringtails because this gives us a chance to show kind of the differences between the raccoon and the ringtail. They're, they're related. Um, the ringtails do like a little bit more of the meat eating side of the diet. They eat small, am small mammals like mice and things like that, um, insects. They like a lot of protein apparently. They're also nocturnal and they're very flexible and very good climbers. They love to be in trees, you know, use a hollow tree or something like that for shelter. This picture is from Hardberger Park. So here is one of the trail camera photos. So you can see how much longer of a tail the ringtail has and skinnier body. So that was how we could identify that this was a ringtail versus a raccoon. David? Uh, a question, uh, are ringtails native to Texas in this area? Yes, they are. Um, I have seen them, I'm trying to think. So besides Hardberger Park, I've seen them on the northwest side of town, like around you know, Babcock, 1604 area. They would be very common in that area. They like wooded um, habitats. So you don't see them so much in, in neighborhoods because they really like to have more cover than that. But if you get you know, into a park or a little bit outside of town, they're fairly common. Any other questions so far? This is one of the other photos of the ringtail where you can see, you can barely see 
he's just kind of peeking out on the side of the branch, but you can see his relatively long tail. So one of the animals that I always like to talk about is the armadillo, which the official common name is nine banded armadillo. And this is a, a photo of an adult armadillo. And this is a photo of a baby. You can see how it's a little bit uh, lighter color and smoother. Um, one of the fun facts about armadillos is that when they reproduce, they always have four um, quadruplets, identical quadruplets. So if you're lucky enough to see a young armadillo family, you might see four babies all at once, which would be really neat. And I do have a, a trail camera photo of an armadillo. It's pretty hard to see, but you can see his, its head, curved body, and the skinny, scaly tail. Question? So I have a question about armadillos. Uh, I always, I know you're not supposed to touch any wild animal, but uh, I've heard that armadillos um, also carry um, a skin disease that you can get. Yes, armadillos actually carry leprosy, which is very unusual in wildlife, um, but they, uh, have actually been used as research animals because of that, you know, to research the disease. But yeah, that's just a really good thing to always talk about that um, touching wildlife could have risks that you might not think of right off the top of your head. They can have diseases that can be passed on to humans, not to mention that they can bite, they could carry rabies, they could scratch. And it's, um, you know, in general, they're more afraid of us than we are of them. And if we're trying to touch them or handle them, they're gonna find that pretty traumatic. So we don't really want to do that unless there's a, a strong need, you know, to because of them being injured or, or some, you know, really compelling reason to try to pick them up or do something like that. <laughs> Thank you. So of course at Hardburger, we have fox squirrels. Um, so fox squirrels, uh, in contrast to most of the species that we're talking about today, are active during the day, which is also called diurnal. And they are pretty well adapted to living in uh, residential neighborhoods because they kind of like to have a mixture of wooded areas and open areas. Um, and they especially like oak trees, which are pretty common in neighborhoods, and they will gather acorns and store them for the winter. We did get uh, a trail camera photo, and of course, it's during the day because that's when the squirrels are active. And so you can see that these, that the motion sensors on these cameras are pretty sensitive that it actually picked up this little squirrel, <laughs> just kind of probably looks like he's picked up some food, maybe picked up a little um, acorn or something to eat there. And of course, the white-tailed deer are pretty familiar to people in San Antonio. Probably a lot of you live in neighborhoods where the white-tailed deer are pretty common. They are mostly active in mornings and evenings, but you, you often will see them kind of walking around during the day too. Seems like especially in neighborhood areas, because I think those, the deer that live in neighborhoods are maybe a little more used to people and aren't quite as uh, wary. Um, and there's maybe, there's generally not as many predators in residential neighborhoods. So the deer do tend to be more bold about, you know, getting into your landscaping and that kind of thing. They uh, mostly eat what's called browse, which means it's um, they actually eat woody plants, but they like to eat the the new little buds, you know, that are coming out on on the ends of you know trees and shrubs, and they like um, green briar vines, and they will eat some some 
herbaceous plants like you know things like clover or maybe very young fresh grass that's coming up question yes um two questions uh related to the um, to where we're at is the carrying capacity for the park uh okay for deer um we don't see any evidence of browse lines hmm. you know that's that's a good question and that's really um that's interesting to bring up the the uh, concept of the browse lines. And I don't know how many of you have had a chance to observe that, but if you have a wooded area that is, you know, has more deer or even more cattle, for example, or, you know, livestock, then it, it has enough food to support, you will, you will have a much more distinctive browse line. So that means, um, so if you're looking through the woods, you'll see that everything's kind of eaten away from zero to about you know six feet off the ground basically where they can reach you know and although deer you know i just said they prefer brows and um they prefer young shoots if they get hungry enough they're going to eat whatever they can find and that that's where you'll start to see that browse line develop where it's it's showing that they're so hungry that they're they're eating everything they can reach basically and it, it is true. I have not observed a, a really distinctive browse line at Hardburger. Um, and part of what might help with that situation is, uh, and it'll depend which part of the park you're in, but the park does, you know, butt up against Salado Creek, which is a, a wildlife corridor, which does provide an avenue for deer to come and go off of the park and maybe you know, be able to explore some other areas to get food, but it also is surrounded by residential. So they don't really have a whole lot of places to go outside of the park to get food either. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that probably it has more deer than maybe is ideal, but the park does have natural predators too, which probably help keep the population in check a little bit. You know, uh, something like a coyote could could take out a you know a young deer at least, and um, so there may be some controls on the deer population that are natural too. Not to mention the occasional ones that get hit by cars or something like that. Okay, um, a kind of related question: um, Is there a species that you know the park? Um, uh, how's the word? Is there a species that we manage for, like an indicator species that would indicate uh, the overall ecological health? Hmm. That's an interesting question. And that's, I have not um, talked to a, a park naturalist lately about whether they have management um, plans based on particular species. But I would imagine that they do keep an eye on the white-tailed deer population because there are, um, you know, there are efforts around town and just in general to um, capture deer and move them off of places where they start to become a nuisance or become overpopulated. And that would be an option if, you know, there was a big problem with deer in the park. Mm -hmm. I know that they do that, uh, well, I've heard in the, um, I guess it's like this, there's a neighborhood that's um, pretty well known. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's one of those small towns in San Antonio that has is pretty famous for having deer problems and they have actually hired wildlife experts to remove some deer and they'll, you know, sell them to a, or relocate them to a, uh, a ranch, you know, where maybe a, a rancher is wanting to have deer for hunting purposes or something like that. Thank you. And I'm definitely gonna ask that question um, to um, the staff here on Monday. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to know if they, if they do have um, indicator species or if they do have concerns about overpopulation of, of any particular species or underpopulation. I know that in general, the, the um, restoration plans and the restoration efforts at the park are geared to um, 
helping species that are, you know, especially species that rely on more um, grassland and prairie type habitats. Mm -hmm. In the chat, they mentioned maybe that there's a, a bird indicator um, because of that grassland restoration. Um, I'm going to write that down and I'm going to ask Jewel uh, on Monday. <laughs> yeah, there are definitely a lot of sparrows and things like quail and um, turkeys that you would see in a more of a prairie or, or a savanna type habitat. And yeah, they since they do get a lot of observations from birders and volunteers, they, they could see if those populations are shifting or the number of observations at least are shifting toward getting more grassland type species. Mm -hmm. That would be a good indicator that your restoration is working. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christine. So because the deer are mainly active mornings and evenings and sometimes during the day we do have, but sometimes at night too, we actually have game camera photos from all times of day of the deer. And one of the interesting observations we got was a photo of an axis deer. And um, when we got this photo and sent it to the park naturalists, they had not seen um, an axis deer at the park at that time. This photo is from 2017. And we only got a couple of photos and I have not heard of a lot of other observations. So this might be one that just kind of came up along Salado Creek and wandered around for a while and then and then left. But um, axis deer are not native to Texas, but they um, seem to do pretty well in the hill country. And there are some naturalized populations of axis deer here in central Texas. And we have coyotes. I've actually seen coyotes coming up along Salado Creek near the park. And uh, um, I think as y'all know, and in fact, Stan was pointing out to me, there was this, there was a, a radio article on Texas Public Radio about a week ago um, from a Texas Parks and Wildlife urban biologist who was talking about coyotes and talking about how, um, because they're very, um, adaptable and resilient, as he put it, that they um, have been able to figure out how to live near human beings and do pretty well, you know, in and near residential neighborhoods. And um, generally, you know, so he's had people ask him, what do we need to do about the coyotes? And he, he thinks that, you know, people and coyotes should be able to coexist, but you do have to take care of your small pets if you have coyotes in your neighborhood. A small dogs and cats could be could be eaten by coyotes. So you will have to watch them. And he suggested if you do have a problem with coyotes that the best thing to do is just to try to scare them away, make noise, you know. Um, he did not advocate trying to, you know, poison them or get rid of them. Just try to keep them, keep them scared of people would be the best thing to do. So they don't feel too, don't feel too bold about getting into your yard and that kind of thing. Don't leave your you know don't leave dog food outside that they'll want to get to, or that type of thing too. So coyotes, we um, I often see them fairly active in the morning and evening, and they are active at night primarily too. So we've got this photo of a coyote from the trail camera at night. We have cottontail rabbits. They are also uh, an animal that's going to be active at night and uh, mornings and evenings types of um, situation. We have gray foxes, we have striped skunks. Um, Stan asked me a question the other day. Uh, he had said that he hadn't seen a lot of skunks this year and was wondering if they had been hit hard by the winter storm. And I hadn't heard any specific, you know, 
discussion about skunks being hit particularly hard, but I have just in general skunk behavior in Texas, they uh, tend to be pretty active in the winter and they don't hibernate. So it, it does make sense that they could have been particularly hit by our unusual winter weather because normally they would be active during the winter and, you know, they would, they would hole up in a, in a burrow or, you know, some kind of shelter to try to stay warm, but the types of shelters that they would normally be using are not, you know, not what you would be expecting to have to protect you from the temperatures going down to nine degrees like we got in, in 2021. So they may have been hit a little hard by the storm. So this is a picture of a striped skunk, which is the common skunk we have around here. There are also a few species of spotted skunks in Texas, which are, are more uh, unusual. And we were very fortunate to get a photo of a bobcat with the, with the trail camera. This was a photo taken about um, 10 in the morning. So this cat was actually walking around pretty late in the day. Um, I know that the park staff had also uh, observed bobcats, especially near Salado Creek. So it, it does appear that the bobcat is using Salado Creek as a wildlife corridor. David? Um, yes, so a comment from Wendy um, that they've seen an almost total loss of their large skunk population uh, just down the road from the park. Um, after the freeze. And I'm sure a, a bunch of the smaller animals that, like you said, their, <laughs> their usual homes are not meant to endure those low temperatures we experienced. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, we expect that to be a temporary dip. And especially since we've had a nice, you know, fairly wet summer and fall, you know, that they should do well to try to build up their populations again this year. But that kind of raises, you know, just the it, it's like an indicator of what the animals have to deal with, with um, climate getting more variable. If we're seeing more extreme weather events, you know, that's just going to make it a little bit harder for wildlife species to get through, get through the winter, get through droughts and things like that. That's a really good observation. And uh, Stan also just sent me a picture of a Gulf Coast toad that he had gotten at a demonstration garden. Uh, so uh, I wanted to add a Gulf Coast toad photo. They, um, this is the common toad that we have in, in Central Texas. And this, this picture on the right is a, a younger toad that I had, I had planted some dill seeds in a pot and I went out to check my dill and found this toad coming out of the pot instead and that reminded me that um, I have heard that back in you know medieval times that people thought that toads kind of sprung up from the ground you know because they didn't understand their reproductive cycle <laughs> but you can see as the toads get older they get more kind of warty and um, less smooth looking Some of the other um, reptile species we see out there. Question? Uh, yes. So, um, do you know who did the camera trapping um, for the, the project? And is it funded by the Conservancy? Yeah, actually, um, the company I work for, SWCA Environmental Consultants, did the trapping, the camera. Uh, in 2017, 2018, and that was funded by the city parks department. And I understand that now that the land bridge has been completed, that the um, parks staff are, are doing, they've got cameras set up on the bridge to continue that, um, that monitoring. But I don't know um, if any of the money comes from the conservancy or if it's all city money. So here we have checkered garter snake. I don't know if y'all have got to see many garter snakes in the wild, but there's very 
many beautiful garter snakes. They're very colorful. Uh, we have Texas spiny lizards, a very common species in oak, ash, juniper woodlands. And we have ground skinks, which is a common species that you'll see in uh, areas that have a lot of good leaf litter on the ground and they, they kind of hide under the leaf litter. So this is the part of the uh, presentation where we would normally be going outside and getting on the trail. <laughs> so um, I just put together some slides to kind of show you what we would be looking for and what you know kind of general concepts to think about if you want to, to observe wildlife or observe signs of wildlife because you know like I was saying, most wildlife species are more afraid of us than we are of them. And when they hear people coming, they tend to hide or they're, no, they're nocturnal species. So they're, you know, hold up during the day and you're not going to see them. So, but you still might be able to sign, see signs that they were there. Um, so that's the kind of things we would look for too. Like this picture shows, um, it shows one of the management techniques they use at the park where when they're pruning trees or if they have to you know cut down a branch that's hanging over a, a pathway or something like that that they'll put those branches out on the ground in the woods and then these provide places for lizards to hide under places for insects which provide food for wildlife so um you know flipping up or looking under logs might be a good way to see some insects or even maybe see some lizards if you get lucky. And of course, one thing we can look for is footprints. Um, I got a couple of photos from Jonah Evans, who's a uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department biologist, and he's kind of an expert in, um, in tracking. And does anyone want to guess what kind of footprints this is from. <laughs> David? Um, I'll guess. Are those from a little raccoon? <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> so raccoons checks are really fun to look at because they look like little hands. You know, they have five fingers. And you can also see on some of these, you know, the claws at the end of their toes. Whereas uh, in contrast, uh, this footprint has four toes. Any ideas, David? Uh, would this one be a dog? Yeah, this is a canine. It's actually a fox print. Oh. <laughs> oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. It's a coyote print. Yeah, it's kind of fat, like a, like a more dog-like. Yeah. So this one's a coyote. This actually looks like a cast of a print. And you can see there's some bird prints too. So that might've been taken near a pond. Mm -hmm. Question? Uh, so we have a question from Wendy. Um, have there been um, bats spotted in the park and also badgers or ferrets in the area? Yeah, oh, that's actually an interesting question about the bats. Cause I was gonna bring that up when we were talking about the storm. Um, you know, um, I don't, I don't think any of the studies that I read were really looking specifically at bats. Like the 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 park has done specific studies where they tried to estimate the deer population, and they've done some studies where they uh, did little pitfall traps where you could capture reptiles. And I haven't heard a specific study to look for bats, but I'm. 100% sure that if you were out there in the evening, you would see bats flying around mm -hmm. looking for bugs. But uh, talking about the storm, that bats is a species that I've heard was hit very hard by the winter storm. And that's probably um, mainly to do with the fact that it would have had a big effect on insects, you know, during that big freeze. And of course, bats need to come out every night and eat insects to, to you know, mammals. Staying warm during the winter takes a lot of energy. So they have to be able to get a lot of food if they're if they're not, you know, complete, completely hibernating anyway. So um, I, I did read reports about a lot of dead bats that were found after the freeze. Mm -hmm. 
Now, as far as badgers, um, we've I know some wildlife studies done at the bats at the <laughs> at the park thought that they saw burrows that looked like a badger burrow, but I don't think anyone's ever caught a, a photo or a, a, I don't know about direct observations of badgers. But you would expect them to be out there, especially if in the areas where the soil is more loamy and um, a little more deep. So maybe sort of in the lower lower elevations of the park. And ferrets, I have not heard of if they have, it seems like that um, we talked last year about some ferret, some people had thought they'd seen a ferret, but I haven't heard of that from um, park staff. So maybe that would be a good question for them, David. <laughs> um, I had a, I have a friend at work who, um, his his mother lives in northern San Antonio, so it wouldn't be too far away from the park. And they got a photo on on their um, just their house, you know, monitoring camera of a what looks like a coati. And uh, that could be an escape pet or something. <laughs> but uh, you know, coatis are very common in Mexico, and um, I, I think that. Parks and Wildlife Department has them on the list for Guadalupe County, which is not too far away. So it's possible that they could occur here, but it's hard to know if it was a a, wild, a completely wild one or an escaped uh, pet or escaped, uh, you know, zoo animal, or something like that. So the other things that we would be looking for while we're out on our hike, we would look for burrows or dens. Like uh, a lot of times what you'll see in the hill country is we have rock outcrops and then the animals will kind of dig under them and have a nice little shelter that way. Or they'll find places uh, you can see here where there's sort of a hollow spot at the bottom of the tree, they can kind of dig and get into um, hollow spots in trees and um, dead trees. A, a lot of um, parks would cut down a dead tree because maybe it doesn't look so pretty, but dead trees and stumps are really great um, possible shelter areas for a lot of wildlife species. So in Hardburger Park, we, we, see, peop we see the park staff leaving the dead trees, uh, you know, unless there's any danger of them dropping a branch too close to where people are. And um, I just wanted to throw these in because a couple of photos I got this year, just like when I walk out my door and saw something, I saw this asp caterpillar just on my railing by my door. These are the kinds of caterpillars, as you know, that uh, can sting you, so you don't want to touch them. And just a couple of weeks ago, I saw this butterfly where you can see it's actually still clinging to its cocoon because it had just come out of its cocoon. And uh, this is a gulf fritillary. But you know, it's just like when you go outside, you never know what you might see and you might see something really cool. <laughs> Some other good places to look for signs of wildlife are rock piles. This, these provide good places for lizards and snakes to hide. I recently saw a coral snake at my property and I wasn't able to get a photo of it, but it went and, you know, as I was trying to get a photo of it, it was running away from me and went and slid under a rock pile just like this. Uh, you can see signs of wildlife that are digging around uh, searching for food. So here's a, it's pretty subtle, but you can see how this, there's this line in the leaves where I, I'm almost positive it was an armadillo that was going through here and they like dig through the leaves with their nose and they'll be looking for grubs and insects and, you know, bulbs in, in, uh, that are underground. Uh, here's where uh, armadillo was kind of like doing the same thing through the leaf litter under a ash juniper. <laughs> And then here, this is probably a wild pigs, actually. Um, they will make a pretty distinctive and 
messy if this is an area where it had rained and kind of gotten muddy and then the pigs like to get in and just wallow around and make a big mess so normally uh, wild pigs are you know kind of they make the most um, distinctive wallowing signs and then the other thing we can look for of course is wildlife poop which um let wildlife scientists will refer to as scat. <laughs> so here is some white-tailed deer scat. Here is a scat. This is a like a raccoon scat. You can see a a, a seed here. Um, that's a Texas persimmon seed. So one of the interesting things about the wildlife scat is a lot of times you can look at it and kind of get a feel for what um, that species might be eating. And persimmon seeds is something you see a lot in raccoon scat. And here we have a dung beetle, which I think are very cool insects that um, will take these piles of poop apart and roll it into balls and they use that to lay their eggs on. So they're kind of like one of nature's um, poop cleaning up species. <laughs> so I really like them. Any questions about wildlife science? Yes, I had a question. So the wild pigs, um, those have uh, traces of them have been found in the park? I don't believe um, that photo I have is not from the park. Okay. And I am not aware of uh, wild pig um, signs at the park. Now, they do get, I am aware of a lot of wild pig signs, um, like outside 1604 along Salado Creek. So they would, they would not be very far away. Um, but I think they are still not quite that far in, into the um, more developed area of San Antonio. Fortunately, because they're not, you know, they're pretty destructive and we would really not want to have them at the park. Okay. Any other questions? I don't think at the moment, but if anybody does have questions, um, oh, okay. Um, have there uh, been, or there have been mountain lions north of here um, at, Tutan Beauregard, I'm not sure where that's. At. Yeah, so that's like off of I 10 near, not too far from Friedrich Park, Tutan Beauregard, you know, like Fair Oaks, that area. Okay. Um, I've heard of, uh, a, I think, um, a parks and wildlife person saw some photos that did, it was like a killed deer that looked like it was could have been a cougar near Helotus. So that's not too far away. And um, I live near Pipe Creek and we definitely have them out here. I've seen a photo of a mountain lion taken, um, you know, a couple of miles off of Highway 16. So again, I think that, um, you know, mountain lions have a very large range and, and they, um, they don't seem to they don't seem to be very interested in getting too close to a lot of human development. So I don't know if we would expect to see them get too much closer to San Antonio, but we definitely don't have them very far away, which is pretty neat. Um, I can go ahead and start talking about the land bridge stuff, but if there's, you know, yes. if anyone thinks of any other general questions, you yeah, can keep one more. popping those uh, up too. Okay. The black rock squirrels. Oh uh, yeah. Near Salado Creek. Have those been also seen um, in this area? Yes, we do have rock squirrels, and rock squirrels are pretty neat. They are. Um, they. Uh, they're they're called rock squirrels because they like rock piles and they like cliffs and you know overhangs and things like that. And um, you might also find them in. Um, areas where there's a lot of downed, well, I've actually seen them in, in like places where they stored uh, a lot of um, 
what do you call railroad ties? <laughs> like they like to have things, they, they're more of a ground dwelling species, but they like to have, you know, logs and rocks and things like that to hide under or, or hollow trees and that kind of thing. And um, unlike most squirrels, they actually do eat insects and small mammals as well as plants. And they have little cheek pouches and they stuff food in their cheek pouches and carry it back to their dens. So they're pretty cool. I'll put pictures of some of those next time. Um, if you, uh, one place that's, uh, you can, at least if they're still there, um, Trinity University has kind of a little running trail on the edge of campus and it has a, a rock squirrel population. That's a good place to see a rock squirrel pretty easily if you'd like to try to do that. So the land bridge, um, I don't know how many people here, it'd be interesting to see how many people have gotten to go on the land bridge already. Um, I And I guess we would have to talk about our next nature hike if we wanted to try to add going over to the land bridge. Um, in the past, we've done the Oak Loop Trail. And as y'all know, I'm sure that the land bridge is accessible from both sides of the park from the trail system. And right now they have signs like this, you know, here and there showing you to how to get to the land bridge. So this is a photo taken from the top of the land bridge. And the way you can see the way it was designed, it's like you're going along the trail and it's really hard to tell that you're on a bridge. They, they kind of have the, the landscaping curved like this. So you're, you're kind of below the level of the, of the wall. This is the wall going along the edge and um, that protects each side of the land bridge so that people and animals, you know, won't be trying to walk off the edge of it or anything. And um, so the veg so the, the landscaping has been kind of bermed and mounded to give you this feeling of being, you know, in still on land and not on a bridge, basically. <laughs> um, and they also have these neat little water features. So this is a, a water feature here to attract wildlife and birds to come and get a drink. And then they have um, wildlife blinds. So essentially this is a place where you can go and sit and you can look through these little gaps and watch that wild, that watering feature. So you can be there where the wildlife can't see you and hopefully that will give you a better chance of, of seeing something um, that might be a little more shy of people And I have this little list of facts about the land bridge. Um, the total cost was $23 million and uh, almost half of it, $10 million came from private donations and grants. And the bridge is named after Robert Tobin, who is a, a legendary San Antonio philanthropist who supported all kinds of arts and nature. Um, projects over the years. And um, the Tobin Foundation is a, a big supporter of all kinds of nonprofit efforts in San Antonio. The bridge is 150 feet wide. And that also has a lot to do with that feeling you get on the bridge where you're, you're still in a park and not on a bridge because it's, it's so wide and it's curved like this. So what you're seeing on either side is vegetation and it, um, you know, both the vegetation and the steel wall help muffle the noise from the highway. It's constructed of arched steel beams and concrete. And then on top of the concrete, there is a layer of polystyrene foam blocks, which is basically like styrofoam. And the reason they used a lot of that for the structure was to help reduce the weight because um, the soil and eventually the, the plants you know, growing in that soil are pretty heavy. And the weight of the bridge was a very strong consideration in doing a safe design for it. 
Um, the walls on either side are eight feet tall. And there is a, 20, a 250,000 gallon rainwater catchment system um, associated with the bridge. So um, the runoff of uh, rainwater coming down one side of the bridge and you know that sloped area going back into the park, uh, they use to catch rainwater and keep in this rainwater collection tank. And then that water is used to do irrigation, especially now, um, you know, since last uh, winter, they've been establishing the plants on the bridge. And, you know, even if you're using native plants that are well adapted to the area, you normally have to give them some irrigation for the first couple of years when they're establishing. And then hopefully they'll do pretty well on their own, but that system will still be in place if you have a, you know, if we have a bad drought or when we're replanting and, you know, supplementing the vegetation that irrigation water will be available for establishing those new uh, plants. And this is a, a fact I got, I heard a um, presentation by one of the landscape architects who worked on this bridge and he said that, well, what he said was that it's basically shaped like a Pringle potato chip and that shape is called a hyperbolic parab paraboloid. <laughs> So it's like um, the bridge arches from one side to the other this way, and then it arches from, you know, end to end, it arches up and down. The width, it arches this way. So it's shaped like a Pringle potato chip, in case you didn't know what that shape was called. <laughs> so this is, uh, like we were saying, that gives you those walls on the side that help make you feel more like you're still in nature, even though you're on a bridge. And here you can uh, get a view of those types of steel arches that are holding up the bottom of it. Any questions on that? I hope if you haven't had a chance to go out there that you do get a chance to do it. Um, the reestablishing plants seem to be doing really well. There's lots of interesting native um, shrubs and prairie species out there as well as oak trees. Um, and those uh, wildlife blinds were, that were designed by local artists are very beautiful and interesting to check out. David? Uh, so we do have a question. Um, what wildlife um, has been using the bridge for sure, or which ones use it the most? Oh, yeah. Um, I know that white-tailed deer were seen on the bridge, even when they were still working on it, um, when they were still kind of finishing the dirt moving and <laughs> planting trees, the deer were starting to come up to the edges to check out those new plantings. Um, Let's see, I, I should actually, um, I should check. I, I, I know that the wild, the park staff got photos of, um, I believe it was an opossum and a raccoon. Do y'all have, have you, uh, Stan and Wendy, have you heard of any more recent sightings on the bridge? Uh, no, but they've posted pictures um, on the Hardberger yeah. site of about four species, several of which you mentioned. Yeah, I was going to say there there are um, uh, both the Conservancy and the Parks Department have websites with a lot of information about all of this. They have information on. Um, like, uh, you, you know, they posted a lot of news releases as the bridge progress was going along. And then as Stan was just mentioning, they have posted some photos of things they've observed on the bridge recently. And of course they have um, information about the park um, ecosystems and uh, studies that have been conducted out there and the uh, upcoming events. So you should check all those out. Also, in the newsletter, um, 
that went out, or I guess it's the quarterly or semi-annual little magazine that goes out. They had pictures of all the different um, species. I've, unfortunately, I don't have it at hand, but they had the uh, basically night uh, version of uh, night camera species pictures. And I, I even know just from my visit, it's not necessarily the larger animals that you'll see walking across the bridge with you. But mm -hmm. my first time on the bridge, there were really big dragonflies tons <laughs> of them just flying around and, and all kinds of other insects and beetles and, and smaller things that are food sources. Um, and they're using the bridge. Um, so I'm sure that'll also entice other animals to start um, traversing that crossing. Oh yeah, I bet the dragonflies love those little water features. And then they'll be laying eggs and you'll have start having the dragonfly larva and other insects populating those features and then things like garter snakes that would eat those type of deals and frogs and um, toads. You know, that would give them a food base. So you'll start getting the amphibians in there and the reptiles. So that's pretty neat. Um, any more questions before we uh, wrap up today? All righty. Uh, well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Um, oh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Hardburger Park and the conservancy that supports it, uh, please visit philhardburgerpark.org. We do have our calendar, uh, and uh, the November events will uh, all be shared very soon. And I can tell you that looking at the calendar for 22, uh, 2022, we have some amazing um, in-person nature walks coming up. Um, I'm really excited to get to attend all of them because <laughs> that's my job. Um, but I know that uh, there's going to be lots of knowledge to be shared. Uh, so definitely please come out and visit our park and look at some of our uh, programming opportunities for you to join us. Um, the Conservancy is a member-based nonprofit, and it relies on donations to support the educational activities um, here in the park. If you are able to contribute, please consider supporting the programs like today's, um, and you can do that on philhardburgerpark.org. Um, thank you so much, Christine, uh, for sharing your time and knowledge with us. I've learned a lot about the animals here at the park, um, and I'm new to the park myself, so uh, thank you again for doing this today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, thanks again, everybody. And we hope you enjoy the, the rest of your weekend. Take care.